Welcome everyone to the first presentation of the 2023 Fishtails Lecture Series, an educational outreach program of Crossroads at Big Creek in partnership with the Door County Library, where we present the science of Great Lakes fisheries. It's great to see you all here in person and all of you uh, joining us via Zoom as well. And for the Zoom watchers, please note the housekeeping points uh, now on the screen. I also want to acknowledge Kagan Haringa and Laura Hauser from Crossroads and Laura Kayakan from the Door County Library. We've got a great lineup for you this more, or this year. First off will be Dr. Dan Eisenman talking about uh, nest fishing and smallmouth bass, and we'll get to that in a minute here. Our second talk will be on uh, Thursday, March 16th, which will be Dr. Val Klump talking about meeting the challenges of restoring and preserving our Great Lakes. A lot of that will, ad will address more of the water quality parameters. You know, you, most of our discussion here about managing fish, but I think he will be looking at the lake as a vessel and, and how is the water quality. He'll talk about the dead zone in Green Bay. He, he also does a lot of the remote sensing. So some of the buoys that you see out there in the summertime, it's his group that, that uses those. So that'll be a very interesting talk. Uh, on the, the third talk, it will be on April 12th, uh, Dr. Daniel Zielinski from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. They're starting an initiative over on the Boardman River uh, in Traverse City to figure out a way to combine fish behavior and engineering to pass the good fish and let the, the fish that you don't want to pass a dam get uh, separated out and taken out. And that, that's especially important for sea lamprey control. And that's why the Great Lakes Fishery Commission is uh, leading that effort, uh, and that effort is called Fish Pass. But I think it'll be very interesting to see how they're setting up that design to try to reconnect rivers without opening them up to sea lamprey and having an extra cost of treatment and that kind of stuff. So it'll be very interesting. Then the last one will be on April 27th, Dr. Nicole Neatlisbach from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I know we've all heard from Scott about the largemouth bass virus and its effect, but now we'll also hear from the, vet, the veterinarian within the DNR and talk about you know, how she approaches it, the parameters that a veterinarian ha would have to uh, consider. And she's also active in the uh, Great Lakes uh, Fish Health Committee of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. So she interacts with other states all across the Great Lakes. And we can hear more and learn more about uh, the ramifications of that largemouth bass virus on smallmouth bass now. In Green Bay. Let's see if I can do this right. Uh oh. Okay. All right. And now on to the feature tonight nest fishing for smallmouth bass. Dr. Daniel Eisenman serves as the unit leader for the U.S. Geological Survey's Wisconsin Cooperative Research Unit at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. He conducts research on fish populations across the state of Wisconsin and trains graduate and undergraduate students who are eventually employed as fish biologists within state and federal agencies. Dan has a very, very, uh, of, of, uh, diversity of background. He received his BS degree from Southern Illinois University, his master's from Tennessee Tech, and his PhD from South Dakota State. Before working at UWSP, Dan worked as a fish biologist for both the Ohio Fish uh, Division of Wildlife and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. In 2021, at a previous fish, fish lecture series, you heard him present his research on walleye and whitefish movement in Green Bay. Dan has been extremely active and helpful in evaluating fishery management issues throughout the state of Wisconsin, including the waters of Green Bay and Lake Michigan. The quality of Dan's research efforts was recently recognized by the fish management section of the American Fishery Society as he was inducted into the section's Hall of Excellence. 50 years ago, when I was a student at UWSP, I joined the AFS, American Fisheries Society, and I'm actually wearing my 50-year pin that I just got in January. But I'm doing that in part to honor Dan's recent achievement. You know, Dan is now a member of a group of some very distinguished fishery scientists. So 
With that, I'm going to hand the mic over to you. Wow. No, oh, to celebrate his induction and welcome here. Let's all give him. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks to all of you that I can't see online. Um, Mark did a really nice job introducing my role. Um, this is a, I got a really fun job, especially when we get to work on small off bass and fish like that. I like, I fish a lot. Uh, quite a bit. So um, this is why I got into it, uh, the business I'm in, trying to figure out why the fish behave the way they do and how we can better manage them. I am a USGS employee and I'm stationed at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the co-op program as we work our way through the slides. So we're going to talk a lot about smallmouth bass today, specifically about smallmouth bass in the Great Lakes. Uh, one of the species that you could argue over the last, I don't know, three to four decades um, has actually benefited from some of the changes that have occurred in the system and uh, compared to some other species. And so we've seen populations of bass, uh, it's been a while back, but sort of explode in a lot of places and create these really tremendous fisheries that attract anglers from all over the country to come fish for really large fish. Um, and one of those places is Door County. I probably don't have to tell most of you in the, in the room this, but it is a destination fishery. Uh, lots of people from all over the Midwest and North America in general uh, come to Door County to fish for these bass. Um, it attracts uh, more than 150,000 hours of angling effort, more than 100,000 fish caught. And this is a mix of both, you know, rec just standard recreational fishing as well as the focus of mini tournaments. Some of these are pretty large scale, and this is very similar to many of these other Great Lakes fisheries where uh, because of the big water, it can handle these bigger events and you tend to see uh, more of them uh, than maybe on some smaller systems. And one of the reasons that we started down this path or our research is that the DNR and I think stakeholders as well started to know some notice some declines in catch rates uh, particularly for larger fish, uh, fish over 18 inches in length, which are sort of those trophy or, or bigger fish that people are really interested in targeting. And so that's sort of where we got involved uh, to start to talk about what we might do to help address this question. And so uh, one of the things that we're always interested in and makes sort of the world go around for fish is what we refer to as recruitment, how many fish do we get in an individual year? And then that's gonna eventually project to how many fish we have available to anglers in the future. And uh, bass are interesting. They're like other centrarchids, they are nest builders and they, they will guard these nests, the males over time. You can see a picture here. Uh, this is actually a Sawyer Harbor smallmouth bass sitting on its nest. And then you can see, uh, this is actually a close up of some bass eggs in a nest in Northern Wisconsin, but this is kind of, a simplified way of how the process starts. So this is sort of the start of that recruitment process. We've got to have spawning occur, eggs laid, and that's the first stage. And then what we're hoping is that those fish hatch. And these, every one of those little black specks is a smallmouth bass fry. This is off one of the nests that we observed in Detroit Harbor uh, this spring. And then eventually we're hoping they make it to the end of their first summer. Uh, that doesn't mean the gauntlet's over, especially when you live in Wisconsin. Overwinter mortality can be a really big player for fish when you have a winter. Now, we're not having much of a winter. That's probably pretty good for bass at this point, considering it. But, but this is one of the things uh, that we're focused on. The title is about nest fishing, and we're going to talk a lot about that. But we're really trying to, what we're really interested in is determining what is influencing how many of these little fish we're getting and does it help us predict what might happen in the future? And so what we do know about bass recruitment is it's really variable. You can say that about any, any fish species out there. Some years it's hard to find an age zero fish and then the next year there's gazillions of them if that's an actual number. Some of the things we know that do regulate how many bass we get at the end of the first year of life 
water temperature regimes, um, especially after the eggs are laid and those fish hatch, fluctuations in water level or flow, storms, and this is especially true in a Great Lakes environment, and then predation and predator density. And so you, you can apply this list really for, for any fish species. It's not unique to smallmouth bass. So one of the things coming into it and talking with anglers and Scott and others is we, we probably know that what we've seen in Door County over the last 10 years or 20 years somehow reflects variability in recruitment resulting from differences in environmental conditions that happened uh, early in life. And if you go to the literature, previous studies tell us this is almost always the case. We can usually link this variability to things that happened in that first year of life or possibly to winter severity. And so the question would be, well, is this the case for Door County smallmouth bass? And Door County, like many places or most places around the Great Lakes, we don't have a lot of information on these young fish. Um, so Scott and his crew spend time every spring monitoring adult fish, but we don't spend a lot of time focused on, on these little fish. And that would be true again in many places. Part of the reason is we're, it's a little bit different environment and we're not exactly sure how to go about indexing how many little bass are out there. Some of the things that we might do in an inland lake don't necessarily work the same when you start working at a Great Lakes scale. Uh, so this is kind of a, a universal problem in the Great Lakes system is we don't have these long histories of how many age zero fish there were uh, in say Sawyer Harbor over a 10 year period, where in a lot of cases, if you go to Lake Erie and you wanna know about the walleye fishery, we have age zero catch rates of walleye from actually usually a couple of years that tell us what, how many fish there were um, in that first year of life. So if we had these numbers, that would help us explain trends that we might see three or four years down the road when those fish get big enough that anglers start catching them. And then we can project a little bit, like what are we expecting? Hey, we've had three or four kind of rough year classes in a row, three or four years down the road, you might expect that fishing may not be as good as it once was. And we don't have that ability right now. We're almost only able to sort of back calculate and try to see what we had based on what we, we see in the adult nets, which is tricky. So that's really one of the, the first question that we set out to answer with our research is to develop this index. And we'll talk about how we went about doing that and then and what we plan to do in the future so that we have that index moving forward. So I mentioned all those environmental factors, but many people would say, well, what about fishing? Doesn't fishing affect how many smallmouth bass that, that I have out on the landscape? Um, and things that have changed probably more like over the scale of the last 50 or 60 years, where in a lot of systems harvest isn't really that much of an issue anymore. Now, if people do harvest bass um, along the Door Peninsula, it's still occurring, but uh, the catch and release mentality has really taken over. Most bass, when you look at the literature, creel surveys, that kind of thing, most anglers are letting their bass go now. And most bass survive the process. There is some catch and release mortality that is associated with that. And I'm generalizing here. If you get really specific, there may be times where that's not the case. And so generally we kind of feel like fishing related mortality, either through harvest or catching them and releasing them, is probably not high enough to affect recruitment of bass, especially specifically in sort of a Great Lakes setting. Um, very different scenario than maybe a harvest oriented fishery like bluegill or crappies uh, where people are gonna keep most of the, you know, often if it's a big enough fish, they're gonna keep that fish. Uh, but there's another element to this because of that nesting behavior I talked about that people are sometimes concerned about and that is the effects of nest fishing. Um, and so during this period where males on the, are on the nest, they are pretty aggressive. Uh, many people would argue that's they're the most vulnerable at that stage to being caught. Uh, but there's actually some interesting science to show that's not always the case. Uh, but they're usually pretty visible and people can see them and they are protecting their nest. And so I'm just going to show you one scenario of what we'll call it the worst case scenario is this is what happens when a bass gets caught. 
So you're going to watch the uh, almighty night crawler come down into the nest here. And then it takes a little while. The videos are the best part, so we're going to let them roll. You missed it. Oh, he's got it. There's a very delayed reaction time on this. The person waiting to realize that the fish is actually on their end of their line, chewing the night crawler, and off it goes. And then what can happen is this. So that bass, this is the same nest. The bass has just been removed. Um, what we see is predation that can occur on the nest. And so in this case, it's bluegills and charcids, you know, in the Great Lakes, we're often could be worried about gobies, things like that. Uh, but this is sort of the worst case scenario, like I mentioned, that we could see in a, in a situation where somebody catches the bass off the nest. So what do we know about the effects of nest fishing, specifically for smallmouth bass? And when I, when I refer to nest success tonight, I'm just going to be talking about a nest that produced fry. Might have produced one fry, might have produced a thousand fry. Because once they hatch, it's really hard to tell exactly how many, but all previous studies have used this approach. And what we do know is that when you take a male off the nest, it reduces the probability of nest success at the individual nest level. But it does not mean that it's a guaranteed failure. So if you go look at these studies, males can come off the nest and get caught and the nest can still be a success. So it isn't a guaranteed failure. But our, our real question as fish managers is what happens at the population level? Can I detect that nest fishing is actually influencing the number of young fish that I'm getting out of the population? Um, and so I would always suggest that something of this nature probably operates along a gradient and you can think about a really small lake in Northern Ontario that's got crystal clear water and not very many bass and they're easy to see. I would think like nest fishing would have a higher probability of having some effect there versus a Great Lakes environment where you have thousands of bass nesting in 10, 12, 14, 15 different places that all vary in terms of habitat, how many anglers are utilizing those locations and so on and so forth. Um, one thing that if you go to the literature, you will not, I, I can still to this day not find a study that has ever shown that nest fishing has had population level effects on, on a bass population. Now there's some modeling out there that suggests it could happen under the right conditions, but that modeling ignored all those other environmental factors we talked about earlier, like water temperatures and storms and things like that. And there are actually several studies that suggest it does not have a population level effect. And that's because these other very large scale factors really dictate how many fish are gonna be out there. So what do we know just about the Great Lakes? So there's really been three studies that have been done prior to our work. Uh, one was on the Beaver Island Archipelago out in Lake Michigan. Mark Kamick, who's uh, in North Dakota now, uh, looked at bass nesting. They didn't look at angling in this study, but the number one factor uh, associated with nest success was water temperature in that early part um, when those eggs are laid and they're incubating and the fry hatch. Um, in the Bass Islands of Lake Erie, Jeff Steinhardt did some work there. I was actually in Ohio when Jeff was doing this. And number of storms was the best predictor of nest success. And angling um, did have some effect on nest survival, but it was really low, like 5% lower than the controls. So nests that didn't get fished versus nests that did. So something measurable. And then I think this last one is really interesting. Uh, Randy Jackson just looked at the data for the New York waters of Lake Erie. So before 1994, they had a spring closure. You couldn't fish for bass um, up to like maybe, I can't remember what the date was. It didn't include the entire nesting period, uh, but most of it. Um, and then they took that closure off. And smallmouth bass recruitment was actually better after they re removed the closure. Probably not due to nest fishing. It was probably just environmental conditions before and after the fact. But it, it's sort of interesting to look at these studies and um, look at the fact that we know 
if I take that male off the nest, it's probably not going to be good for that individual nest, but that doesn't always like sort of percolate up to the, the population level. However, um, that doesn't mean people are not still concerned about it. Um, it's something we can see, like people can see people out nest fishing. And even in your head, if we know it's bad at the individual nest level, it's really hard to not think about it having an effect at the population level. And so that is that is primarily the reason that we are looking into this as part of our research is to provide sort of some local uh, baseline for looking into nest fishing and what it might mean for smallmouth along the Door Peninsula. So that's our second question. Um, do nest success and recruitment vary in relation to a suite of environmental variables, storms and water temperatures, as well as angler effort and how often those bass are disturbed on their nests. And that's where we come in. Uh, the co-op unit program, uh, we're stationed at universities all around North America. And uh, one of our primary tasks is to help our local partners address questions, applied questions related to fisheries within the, within the state. And so that's kind of what we're doing here. Uh, this, well, these questions arose from discussions with the DNR, but also um, I and several of my crew sat in on some public forums and listened to what the public had to say about it and actually had some input into where we might go about doing these things. I'm not sure what this is, <laughs> but we'll move on. On the grad student side of things, I'm here talking to you tonight, uh, but this is the guy that's making this all happen. Eric is our grad student that started on the project and uh, was basically lived here from, I don't know, late April through, uh, through mid-July, uh, watching bass nests and doing all kinds of other things, and then came back in the fall and did our age zero survey. So, and this is basically the, the presentation or the title slide. So our project is, is understanding smallmouth bass recruitment in relation to nest fishing. The study sites that we ended up selecting, and this is where we did get input, uh, and then some things happened, it didn't work out. Uh, we ended up with Little Sturgeon Bay, Sawyer Harbor, Moonlight Bay, and Detroit Harbor. And the real reason that we chose the sites we did is we wanted a gradient of expected fishing effort. We expected that Little Sturgeon and Sawyer would have quite a bit of angling effort, and that Moonlight, would have less and Detroit Harbor should have none because it's closed to fishing during that period. But what you're gonna see today is that there was an eensy teensy little bit of effort up there and we helped set those people on the straight and narrow. Uh, but those are our sites. The other thing to keep in mind is we got two sites that are on the lake side and two sites that are on the bay side. And that's probably gonna factor into the preliminary results that I'm gonna show you today. So first we wanna focus in on how do we index the number of little bass we have every year? Like what should we do to start keeping track of that? And what we're doing is using a variety of gears that we typically use to capture small fish. And Scott and his crew, DNR folks, they've tried some of these in the past, uh, but we're just giving them sort of all, all, all a look, so to speak. Uh, you can see there's a mini fike net pictured up there in the first picture. Uh, one of the things that's really worked well for us for little fish inland is modified boat electrofishing. So many of you are probably at least vague, vaguely familiar with the DNR standard boat electrofishing where they go out at night and chalk up fish as a survey. Those surveys are usually targeted at adult fish. So how we modify it is we go really, really slow and we use really fine mesh and we're targeting those little fish. I mean, we're looking for fish, like those bass are maybe like two to four inches long at the end of summer. So uh, they would probably go through the mesh that we normally use in the net. And then another approach that we've been using inland is this handheld anode electrofishing. And this takes the same electricity that we would normally be putting out in those booms you saw in the last picture and basically confines it down to this single ring. And the way that shocking works is it's, you know, kind of the bigger they are, the harder they fall. It's based on surface area. A really small fish is really hard to shock. And so you need more power in order to immobilize them. 
Um, and that's what we've been using for, for some of our work. So you just hold the wand and you know, you're just scooping up all these little fish. Um, and that's the other gear that we tried to use. And then the second question is nest success and recruitment. So hopefully you can see these transects. We went to our sampling sites and we laid out three transects and no nesting areas, one shallow, uh, one medium and one deep. And we use the deep site because evidence suggests or folks have suggested that maybe some bass are spawning um, rel in relatively deeper water. And so you can see the transects on the map here, the two shallower ones, we could see the nests. Uh, so we did those by boat. On the deepest one, we used an ROV. So a remotely operated vehicle. It's like a little, basically a glider with a camera and we were able to cruise around. And then after we did that, we actually had some help from Scott and his crew to go out and kind of ground truth. Were there any nests in these areas? And one of the things we found is that there's not, there's not any bass nesting in those deeper areas, at least in these places that we looked. They may be doing it in other places, uh, but we didn't find any nests in those deeper strata. And we really didn't even find that many in the medium strata. Most of the nests were in this in the really shallow strata, in these locations anyway. Um, so we, we have some slides with that plotted and I left them out tonight for the sake of time. Um, and then what we then what we did is on those transects, we really focused in on 30 individual nests. These were our focal nests that we were going to follow through the entire nesting period. And this was a little tricky because what we found is that there were a lot of nests made and they just fail. Like we had, we had one storm event come through and that basically wiped the slate clean. We went from having a bunch of bass up on nests and moving around around the nest to nothing in 24 hours. We were tagging whitefish. They come back and they start again. Uh, but, you know, if you said, I'm going to count every nest I ever saw, whether it was a success or failure, they would largely be failures. These nests, we waited until there was a male on the nest. And so we've gotten rid of that preliminary period where they're kind of going through fits and starts. Um, and maybe weather and some storm events and that kind of thing. Um, so we marked them with a numbered tile. So when we came back, we could always see them or we could see them at least. I don't know, I guess if you were looking real hard, you might see our tile. And then we were measuring things like male presence, nest survival, again, whether fry were produced, relatively how many eggs or fry were there, uh, predator abundance, and then these other environmental factors. And I'll talk to you about how we're gonna do that. And then it's kind of blocked out here. But again, next nest success is just going to be whether or not that nest produced fry at the end of this evaluation. The environmental factors that we focused in were water temperature. Uh, so six of these hobo pendants went out at each of the spawning locations, two at each of the depth strata. And then we are calculating storm frequency based on the weather information from the airport. Uh, here, there's a National Weather Service station there that's providing us our, our data for that. And then this is kind of the fun part. How do you figure out how often a nest is disturbed? That's something that no previous study has really done. They don't know, like, how many times does an individual bass see a bait during a day? And so our approach for this was to, to put GoPros on the nest. And you can see our GoPro, dare I use this? It gonna work. Is it on? Okay. Anyway, you can see it right here. That white, like Tupperware. This is an unpainted version, so you can see it. So we painted these to look like rocks, and we backed them. I don't know, two to three feet away from the nest, and left it there, filming for up to four and a half hours. Uh, we'd have to come back. The batteries don't last that long. Um, and the bass usually just kind of swam off a little bit. And then if you watch the GoPro, they're usually back in front of that GoPro in like 10 seconds or less sitting on the nest. So we were a little bit worried about us disturbing the fish, but they didn't really go very far. And this lets us see how often do these things see a bait. This is not the fun part. 
we have over 400 hours of video that you have to sit and watch. And it's really cool at first, but eventually the plot is exactly the same and you're just watching hours and hours of bass sitting on a nest. And so we're through about 225 hours and we have more than 400 to get through. And what we're measuring is how often do we see a bait? Um, what kind of other disturbance events occur? There are many. Uh, bass chase a lot. Uh, one of the really interesting things we've seen is that in, in places like Sorter Harbor, centrarchids like bluegills and sunfish, they're the predators, not gobies. And when they're around, a bass just has to chase and chase and chase. When gobies are around, the bass isn't doing much chasing. The gobies just kind of stay where they are. I think they've learned very quickly that moving towards that bass could be bad. Um, but when the bluegills are there, it's amazing how much energy those bass invest. And you see perch and rock bass, it's just not. Um, and in other places, gobies are really prevalent. Time away from the nest, egg predators. So we count like certain stretches of video, like how many predators do we see in that amount of time? We're looking for hook wounds. You'll probably see some tonight. And then just where are these nests? What kind of cover and structure are they in? And then the other key component of that is angler effort. So the DNR does creel surveys and they're covering, you know, basically the entire peninsula. We focused in on these core areas and just counted anglers all the time. Every time we were out there and then at randomized times. And we also marked down on a map where they were so we could see where they were relative to where nests were. And we did this. Uh, from May 17th to the day that fry dispersed from the nests. All right, so what have we found thus far? Um, yeah, these are fairly complicated, but the one thing uh, that so far we've learned is that modified electrofishing that I talked about, where we go slower and just use a finer mesh net, is really providing us with our highest catch rates and our most consistent catch rates. I would never say they are consistent. They're just more consistent. And then maybe the other interesting thing is that uh, Little Sturgeon Bay uh, is where we saw the highest catch rates of these age zero fish. And one of the key things is clean rock habitat. That's where these fish are. So, you know, whenever we encounter that habitat, that's where we catch age zero smallmouth bass. And, and there's, a, there's some of that in each of these places, but there's more of it in, in Little Sturgeon Bay than in the others. So this, these are angler effort maps. Remember I said we were counting anglers every time around the water. Uh, black dots represent nests that were part of our surveys. And the yellow dots are any time we saw a boat there. Um, so you can see this played out sort of how we planned it, right? We wanted Sawyer and Little Sturgeon to be high effort. You see a lot of yellow dots or gold dots. Moonlight Bay, some, but not very many. And then again, remember Detroit Harbor is supposed to be our reference location with no angling, but there's a few gold dots there. So I think this was like one or two people out when Eric was out there. And he went over and talked to them. They're probably crappy fishing as the as it goes, but um, so some effort was was going on there, but really limited. But you can see the amount, you know, the number of dots that we got in Little Sturgeon Bay and a lot of them around that area where our transects were. And this is what we saw in this first year. Uh, remember our focal nests, we tried to get 30 of them in each place and that was with a male present. So there was a male there. So kind of eliminated again, some of that early failure. And then these are the success rates. So Sawyer and Little Sturgeon uh, over 40%. So in the literature, 30% is a pretty high number. So these two locations are, are higher. Part of that is maybe the way that we measured it with the males being present. Moonlight and Detroit are, are, are much lower. And part of this is that exposure to the main lake. Uh, Moonlight Bay is a tough place to be a bass. You know, there were days where Eric was like on the inside part of his transect and it was 50 degrees and on the outside, it was 37 degrees, you know? So a lot of temperature shifts, more exposure to wind. You can also see, um, how late peak nesting was in Moonlight Bay. So we're out there every day, or Eric was, uh, almost every day rotating among these things. So we got a pretty good idea of when peak nesting occurred. 
The really interesting thing is, remember all those gold dots on the map? Most of those were before peak nesting occurs. So there is a lot of anglers out there and a lot of the tournaments where anglers were targeting shallow bass, but we weren't at peak nesting yet. Some bass were probably nesting, but they were also probably just targeting bass that were shallow and not necessarily on a bed, so to speak. We knew the bass were there, we could see them. Um, they just weren't locked down on a nest with eggs yet. And this is when we saw, those are the dates where we saw most of it. This year could be totally different, right? It's, it's a year to year thing. So like right now we don't even have any ice. Things could go a lot quicker, things could change and go a lot slower, but at least for this first year, that was sort of an interesting observation that could very well change. All right, so what did we see on the cameras? Mostly what we saw is a lot of this. And that is a bass being a bass. Chasing every once in a while, just hanging out around its nest. Um, this is kind of blurry, but you can see it making a few chases. And these are not um, after lures. It's just chasing away predators. I'm going to guess probably a centurion. And then sometimes we saw this. So you should see there's a bait that just dropped in there, over there in that corner right there. You're gonna see that same bait show up again. We cut this video down. I think it shows up a total of five times. It should end up right. You might not be able to see it because of our, it should, there it is again. The bass just never eats the bait. Um, and whether that's because the bass has already been caught or he's just really smart, but some of the times, maybe that's the wrong bait to have on. I, I probably wouldn't be throwing that bait. No offense to anybody in the room. I'm looking for a green pumpkin tube to drop in. But um, we did see that happen a, a few times. In total, we haven't seen a lot of these bass actually uh, get targeted while our cameras are out there. So getting targeted is, is pretty rare. And then sometimes this happens. Oh, no, that's the same video. Sorry. This is it, I think. Looks like a lipstick jig and then, oh, he wanted to eat it, but the rock bass beat him too. And then it shows up again, but he doesn't eat it. He saw the rock bass and he learned that that was a bad. And then this is the one I already showed you um, where it actually does get caught. And there, you know, we saw this happen in 225 hours so far, twice, where the bass gets caught and there's actually um, the bluegill pretty. It's both in Sawyer Harbor where there's this in Charkids. So thus far, we haven't seen a whole lot of, um, we've seen everything else you can imagine, uh, turtles and chasing off guard. They don't chase muskies. They just go down to the bottom and hide. They've learned to not chase them, but everything else they usually chase, the turtle, I don't, I can't show you every video. We're going to have to make like a YouTube channel at the end. Like the bass comes up and like bites the turtle's leg to run them off. So they're not really afraid of a whole lot, but the muskie, the few muskies we've seen, they have been. And so that's really where we are right now. Um, we need a, another year of data to, you know, bump it up to 800 hours of video and to look at nest success again, because each year is going to be very, very different. What we're hoping to do, though, is provide a sampling method. I mean, I think our vision for this is after we determine how to sample the age zero fish, the next phase is to see if it works, right? So you sample them at age zero for five or seven years and then see if that accurately predicts what you get five to seven years down the road. And then you've got a useful tool um, and then we're going to hopefully be able to help address whether any kind of management actions could improve recruitment um, or if recruitment is really largely driven by environmental factors that that makes it a little trickier for you for you as a fish manager to do anything that's going to really make a difference in the numbers of fish you're going to have every year and then and then just help address stakeholder concerns about nest fishing. Um, we know that some people are I guess you could say for it and some people are against it. And I think everybody wants to do what's best for the fish. Um, and so that's why we're kind of looking into it. A lot of people to thank the funding for the project all comes from the DNR, including the Bureau of Fisheries Management and the Office of Great Waters. 
Um, besides a lot of help from um, Scott's local people, Greg Sass and Stephanie Shaw with research helped them the design of the project. A whole bunch of people at UWSP, technicians that are out there in the field with Eric. And then we did have support from the Smallmouth Bass Alliance in securing funding for the project. And so one of the really interesting interactions that we've seen quite often is with another fish that you may not expect. You'll have to watch this go through. So there's a lot of gar roaming around these same areas that the bass are. And so these, these bass are busy. You know, they're, they're not just sitting around doing nothing, even if they're not being fished for. So they leave the nest quite a bit in a lot of the videos. They're leaving the nest anyway. Um, and that's one of the things we're interested in is the amount of time they're gone from somebody catching them and releasing them, similar to the amount of time they might be gone, like when they chase a gar off 50 yards and come back. I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's something that we're looking at in the video. So yeah, at some point we'll have to figure out a way to put a video montage together after we get through all of this. But with that, um, I'll take any questions. If anybody has them, I don't know if they're gonna try to chat in or. Okay. You're going to do another study this, this summer. What's your timeline after that? Two years is off, or are you going to do a third year, or what? I mean, two years is our plan. Um, that, that's mostly related to funding. That's usually how funding works. I think the hope is with the sampling of the eight zero fish that we'll work with Scott and figure out a way for us to collect it. get those samples every year for a long period of time. So we can test whether that index is useful. But the nest fishing part, right now we just have the two springs. I will say we're going to be transitioning into another phase of the spring where we're going to be putting transmitters into 200 ish smallmouth bass in Green Bay and look at how connected these spawning groups are. You know, is Sawyer Harbor its own entity or is Sawyer Harbor kind of connected to Little Sturgeon Bay and direct the state? They're all like one bigger unit. Um, which makes a difference in terms of management and a, you know, whether or not something like nest fishing could be a factor, right? If they're really just a small group of fish, that's very different than if they're a big group of spotters spawning in different locations. So that'll start this spring as well. So go ahead, sir. The, uh, um, the pictures you showed there, uh, the, the that's guarding the nest. They're usually a male, right? Yeah, yeah. So when the female comes in, makes the nest, lays the eggs, and then the male leaves. Yeah, the, the male makes the nest. Yeah, yeah. So we actually have at least one video where you can see, like, the male will court more than one female too. So when he when he's starting out, you can see him. They're making these loops trying to find a mate. And they're like swinging wide around the nest. And a couple of times you can actually see him bring a female back to the nest. And one of them does at least has two females, two different females. But the female doesn't really show, I'll say, a lot of parental care. Some people say some, but I've, I've not observed it. I think you can catch females around beds, but they're going to spawn in more than one nests so i think they're just in the vicinity right and they're in the act of spawning maybe between nests or or beds but they're usually not as aggressive as the males are in guarding the nest how long does the male stay there so usually what we've seen is it lasts about two to three weeks you know and that depends on water temp if you get a really warm spring and it warms up really fast those eggs are going to incubate really quickly and hatch really quickly and that's actually probably the best scenario for the bass. So like every setback you get is more time that the eggs are incubating. And incubation is really tough. That's There's a lot of predators. You start getting like fungus and other things growing on the eggs. Um, so you want, you, your preference would be a nice steady warming spring, I think. And then those eggs would incubate relatively quickly and get hatched right away. 
Yeah, but the male's the, the garter. was going on okay near those nuts yeah so it's all based on when we were there so the obvious event it wasn't it was sometimes we had two crews mostly one crew so whenever they were there they would count boats but then they also followed sort of a standard creel survey design where at certain times we would just go there and count boats we wouldn't we wouldn't do anything else we would just show up like fishing effort is usually higher in the evenings right on during the week and on weekends. So we would try to get there at those times to count boats because we weren't trying to exactly estimate how many hours of angler effort there were. We just wanted it to be relative. We wanted to be sure like Little Sturgeon Bay has a lot more fishing effort than Moonlight Bay or Sawyer Harbor. So then when we're looking at nest success and recruitment, we're confident that saying Little Sturgeon Bay is like the highest fishing effort of the four places we were, we're pretty comfortable with that assertion. It to, to try to be there every day would be really tricky. And some days you can't even go because the weather, right? You're not, you can't go see a nest because the wind's blowing and you, no matter what, you just can't do it. So we can't, that's, that's tough. Like you want to go, you want to be out there because you know you need to be, but if the wind's blowing the wrong direction, you can't visual, visually see anything to like count eggs or see if there's fry present or not. We have not on this study. I, I think partly, I don't know. I mean, there's, I, I'm hoping we lend a certain air of objectivity to the process because it is a, a topic of discussion amongst folks and we would just not want there to be any issues with who may or may not have collected our data right so we're, we're just out there doing it objectively is i think the primary reason that we did it that way i'm wondering how visible from the surface are the cameras that you're um, so the one I showed you is basically what they look like unpainted. When they're painted, when they're painted, I mean, if you're looking real hard, you could see them. But we didn't have anybody come up to us or say anything about seeing them. And you know, we interacted with people. I'm sure people did. They're they're not like how many fishermen attempts to fish nets. Yeah. Dude, well, they wouldn't know it was a camera. It doesn't look anything like a camera. Yeah, it, it just looks like a, a like a weird rock. So I, but you're right. And I wonder if it is, does it make them more likely to fish it or less likely to fish it? But it would just be like a really weird rock. Maybe yeah, I, I thought about trying to do something where maybe we could get some citizen involvement. And like set them out and say, all right, there's 10 bass nests in the vicinity that have a camera up, even telling you they have a camera. How many of them can you find? But I don't know how it would influence them. I think if they see the bass there and they're they're gonna fish bass on the bed, whether that weird looking rock is there or not, I mean no, no. Now maybe that I've all told you now you'd be out on the lookout for them and be like, oh I don't know. I don't want my weird goby lure to be on film. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going back to the same nest. Where is the nest abandoned after this fish is caught? So, yeah, so we didn't see much of it. Um, the one that I showed you that the bluegills ate the eggs, that bass did come back. Um, but if you go look at the literature, there's actually a lot of information on it. And so removing the bass does increase the chance that it will abandon the nest, but it doesn't guarantee it. So they normally come back. And it depends on how far away you moved it, how long you handled it, what's the water temperature. The other thing that really determines how much a bass will invest in its nest is what he's already got invested in it. 
whether it's got eggs, how much predation has occurred already. You know, if, you, if things haven't been going well and, and then something else doesn't go well, maybe you just don't go back because, you know, you've, you've invested. There's like a lot of, we could talk all night. There's so many interesting things about smallmouth bass behavior in terms of age and size and who spawns in a given year. Not, not all males may spawn in a given year and how they behave based on how many eggs are in their nest, like how um, successful they've already been often dictates like how aggressive they'll guard that that brood. So it's just really variable, but but it does increase the chance that it will abandon it uh, compared to not being caught. Um, well, we looked at them where they were, so I would say less than three feet, and I would say even shallower than that, to be honest with you. Um, and we did see some out deeper, don't get me wrong, but we didn't see any out really deep, that ROV or, or with the, I think when we were in the public forums and some people were uh, really adamant that there was deeper nests, I do believe that happens in places. But I also think after talking to more people, it's it's distance to shore. Like we would talk to people and be like, oh, there's deeper nests out here. It's like, well, no, they're the same depth. They're just way offshore, right? You know, they're it's still shallow enough. Some are deeper. It's just in the areas that we were looking and at the time we were looking, we didn't find any. And that ROV was pretty good. We could see a lot of bass on it before they were nesting, like running out in front of the um, in front of the cameras and that kind of thing. So it doesn't mean they don't do it. It just, in those sites, we didn't see a lot of it. It's going to affect the bass day on the nest or Yeah, the yeah. So, I mean, the big events like that are gonna have big effects, right? If you have bad water temperature regimes and it gets really cold during incubation, that's gonna affect all the bass, right? Or a lot of the bass. Same with a storm. If you're on a certain shoreline and that wind is pitching right at you, um, it is it isn't you, it's not you, you and your buddy are kind of in the same boat at that point. And so that's why those bigger, like overarching things tend to come out. When we look at fish recruitment in general, not just smallmouth bass, those big environmental factors are usually what explains most of the bounce and how many fish we see. Um, and we did see it, like I said, in uh, Little Sturgeon early on, like Aaron was out there and we started seeing nests. They weren't guarding them or anything yet, but they had started to build them. And then we just had that, that storm event and it kind of just wiped the slate clean. And within a day, there were bass back in that vicinity spawning. It's not like they gave up and left. It's just, you know, if you were to count every one of those little saucers that shows up as a nest and, and then calculated success rate, it would be really low. Uh, Cause they're like starts, fits and starts, you know, it's like, oh, if I try over here, it didn't work. I'm gonna move a hundred yards this way and try again, that sort of thing. I don't know forums and I hear it every day. We are fishing in the wrong place to fish move more people, which is not really a fact. Not not in these locations where we look. So you saw where transects. Yep. Um, I don't know. I'd have to ask Eric what the total count was. Yeah, But yeah, I mean, uh, again, at the individual level, for sure.
Mais il y a... Yeah, and I mean, I would have to go, I, I'm not familiar with that study that shows that they won't, like, after you harass them, they don't return back to the same. Okay, yeah, I'll have to look for it, because I, I, that's not something that we've, we've run in Chrome. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, and there's a difference between a study and a study. I can find lots of people that will either back, back, you know, like what I say or what you say, but it, but it's not actually vetted. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's probably related to eggs. You know, again, like I said, as soon as they have an investment in their investment, their behavior really changes, I think, quite a bit. I, I do want to take an opportunity to ask someone on Zoom. Sure. If there are any questions from anybody on Zoom, you can unmute yourself and ask them. Anybody? Well, then I got another question. What is the deepest nest that you found? Um, Eric would be able to better answer that for you. He has told me. I'm going to say it was like in seven feet of water but it wasn't over 10. And again, like I think Gary's right, you know, there's different habitat types that we're focused in on. That's why I carefully say like, they may be doing it, they're just not doing it in these locations that we're looking at. Um, and I'd have to check with Eric, you know, exactly. He's the one that was out there doing all of it. And we would, uh, you know, we've talk, we talked about trying to get to the flats last year. I think you saw what we pulled off here and how much time and effort that took. And you got to have your days line up to be, sometimes you can't get on the water at all. Um, so you're double dipping and doing two sites because we know that it's a different habitat type than the three or the four places that we're, that we're visiting. Another question. It was interesting, you had uh, your peak nesting periods and your location range from early June, June 5th to July 7th of May. And you said it's a drama. Is there, is there a precise temperature, not precise, but a range of temperature that is best for that? Is that what's controlling when the peak nesting period is? And what is that temperature? Yeah, I mean, there definitely is. It's all, whenever we start to say fish do this at a certain temperature, they show us that we're not very good at it. I think what happens in Moonlight Bay is that they they start and then water comes in and it gets cold and that like kind of pushes them back and so eventually it must hit i'd have to look at the we have the tops obviously we just haven't looked at it. whereas um in sawyer harbor and little sturgeon even though the temperature can fluctuate quite a bit you're not getting that cold lake water blowing in there and, like setting everything back as far so moonlight is just like they're starting, but then they stop, and then they're starting, and then they stop, and then they're, um, you know, so they don't get that nice trajectory of. So I'd say it's more of that. If it was facing the other way or protected, I think you would see it in line with the other two, but because we constantly have that cold, that colder water coming in, I think it just keeps hitting like a reset button, and they're going to wait until things are right. I would say that in places like that, it's similar to like a really bad spring in northern Wisconsin, right? You just keep getting reset and reset, and eventually, sometimes they just don't do it at all. 
um, if the conditions are that bad, they just don't really spawn. Very few fish spawn. So I don't know if you had, a, I think 55 is sort of like 50 degrees, you know, that's what the books would tell you. But anytime you put a Templar in your fish, we find out that what the books tell you is exactly what the fish do. But I think that's probably in the vicinity of what the books do. So oh, I got another question. So a big storm comes through and destroys all the nests. Say the males come back and then reestablish the nest. Well, does that mean that the females are going to come back too? Or do, I mean, so the females are protract, protracted spawners. They don't blow all their eggs in one spot or one time. You know, well, I, mean? I would say they get rid of all their eggs. Sure. So if the nests fail after the eggs are laid, that's where bad things have happened. The nests that we saw that Eric saw fail were before any exit. Like it was early in the compression. So they came back. But I think if you're through spawning, that's it. And if then a storm event comes through, then you're going to have pretty significant brood loss. And we that event was just lucky enough was, you know, when they were just kind of starting to make nests. And like Gary said, they weren't they weren't loyal to them. They you could just see the nest. And they were around it, but they weren't, you know, they weren't that loyal to it. And then that day we were there tagging whitefish and it just blew in and they called or texted me and said, yeah, they're all pretty much gone. And then two days later, there were bass back in those general areas, but it was well ahead of any eggs being laid. Yeah. Yes, we have a pretty elaborate definition of the storm that I didn't want to bore you with tonight. But which way the wind, the fetch, and like the direction? So it can blow 30 miles an hour, but if the wind's coming at the bank, we're, that's not a storm for that location. Um, so it's like a certain level of wind direction for a certain amount of time from a certain direction counts as a storm. And it's the same metrics that the same metrics that the previous Great Lakes studies have used. So it is very specific and you're right, the direction of the wind is part of the formula. Okay. In the, in the bed, but Bale's been there for a while. He's established and he's pretty much that's the one he's going to use. And that fish gets removed and taken away. 100 yards, he'll come back to him. Or not? Yeah, it's not something that we, we know at our. So I think I, you could go to the literature but, and figure out some of that. But maybe not the scenario you just provided, right? They're going to go catch a bass and move it 100 yards, but they don't know like what stage. Yeah. Five miles, 10 miles. Well, so <laughs> I don't know the answer. But pretty amazing. So in the second, in 2024, we're going to do a di displacement experiment, uh, but it's not necessarily meant to be with bad and bass. It's just a sort of like a simulation of what would happen in a tournament setting. Um, but I don't know why it couldn't be with bed and bass and we would move them pretty far. I think the easy answer, which you already know, is the farther you move it, the less likely it's going to be to come back. But yeah, I don't know how far you can move it in it. I think that was before me. That that particular line. The key always is is where was it caught? 
know how that getting that information out of the turtle <laughs> there, where'd you catch that fish? So it was always a matter of yeah, they moved somewhere, but did they move back to where they were caught or they just go to the next the best next best spot? And that's that's what the telemetry stuff. Could they be part of the Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we did the tag thing that we have done since I've been here. That this fish do move back and forth between Little Sturgeon and Sawyer and Sturgeon Bay um, fairly frequently. Not they're still pretty much home bodies, but some of them do move back and forth there during even during the spawn or just before the spawn. Not you know in like August or September. So. And the same with Riley's and Burke. Yeah, I think that's an easy, easy. I mean, they're amazing when you go read the literature on how far they've been moved, and Mark and I were talking about it earlier. They make some of them always make it back. Huh? You know, for the displacement thing, we've been talking about well, do you have to move them on the lake, or could you drive them on shore? Would that mess up their? Like, because we don't understand how they get back there. Is it something about being in the water, or is it, you know, it's like migration? You know, we're just barely beginning to understand how birds do it. But how does a massive drill 30 miles away and find its way to that? I think it wasn't a live well, right? It didn't swim it on its own. How does it make it back or know where it's supposed to be? And, and a lot of times it would be relatively quickly. I don't know. So yeah, it'll be interesting to, to be. There are tons of, and there's a really rich literature associated, you know, with what we're talking about tonight that I I wasn't a part of. People before me and that have done a ton of really cool stuff. Like Dave Phillip and Mark Bridgeway are are two names if you're looking for really interesting bass ecology and science like related to nesting. I've done some incredible things with with that stuff. So is there anybody else on Zoom that would like to ask a question? Hearing none, thank you very much. Yeah,